Okie doke, let's get started on the kind of hard and confusing and tricky part of chapter 14. The other stuff has been fluff, molecular orbital fluff up to now. Okay, so this is the stuff of aromaticity. And aromaticity is really all about the differences we see in a molecule like benzene. So, here's benzene. Nice six-membered ring, three double bonds. You would think it would be pretty much the same thing as cyclohexene, just times three. Absolutely not. Cyclohexene, we know cyclohexene is kind of some kind of puckered thing. These are sp3 hybridized carbons. Seems bent. Hmm. Benzene, on the other hand, is flat as a pancake. What's weirder yet? That's not a single bond, double bond, single bond. No, all the six carbon-carbon bonds are perfectly equivalent in terms of bond length and bond strength. Very odd. Odder yet is the reactivity. You guys know that when you take red-orange bromine and add it to a sample of cyclohexene, containing cyclohexene, the red-orange color of the bromine dissipates because it's consumed to give the 1,2-dibromide. Try that with benzene, you're going to get nada. You'll add a drop of red bromine, and guess what? The whole thing is going to stay red-orange. No reaction. All right, we'll make it work. How about if I f use forcing conditions to get bromine to add to benzene? Well, it won't work yet. It doesn't add, it undergoes a substitution, plucking off a hydrogen and putting on a bromine. So what is the deal with benzene? The deal with benzene is that it's aromatic. It possesses this unbelievably super special stability. And that special stability is known as the aromatic um, energy. So what is with this special stability? Well, it has everything to do with, get this, molecular orbitals. And something called Huckel's rule is used to help us predict whether or not a molecule is going to be that super stable, in other words, aromatic. There are four criteria that make a molecule aromatic. This first one, which I'm calling the magic number, is really Huckel's rule. That there's a special number, a magic number of electrons in p orbitals. The molecule must be cyclic. The molecule must be planar. And the molecule must be conjugated. Remember what I'm talking about when I say conjugated, particularly in this chapter, is that for each atom in a row, each atom and its next door neighbor all along the row in some kind of cycle, like so, has a p orbital. So, must have a p orbital. It may be empty, it may be filled, but every atom right next door has a p orbital on it. The magic number is 2 or 6 or 10 or 14. In other words, if there's an odd number of pairs of electrons, one pair would be 2, three pairs would be 6, obviously, and so on and so forth. This number of pair, this number of electrons in conjugated p orbitals in a cyclic planar molecule makes it aromatic. If it's an even number of pairs of electrons, in other words, if the p orbitals in a cyclic planar conjugated molecule contain 4 or 8 or 12 dot 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 electrons. It is known as an anti-aromatic molecule and that is especially unstable. Okay, so we will use this little laundry list of four criteria to determine whether or not a molecule is aromatic. 
All right, so how do we translate this to benzene and look at its stability and understand its energy uh, stabilization by aromaticity? Well, of course, we'll draw the molecular orbital diagram. So as in previous examples, we've got energy on the left. We're going to look at um, the MO diagram over here with the different energy levels. But to make it simple, there's something called a frost diagram, which basically stipulates that you take the shape of the molecule and place it so that one of the vertices is on the bottom and that is a perfectly acceptable representation of the energy levels for the molecular orbital diagram which is kind of amazing. So we're going to construct our molecular orbital diagram so that there are zero nodes, two degenerate molecular orbitals with one node, two degen degenerate molecular orbitals with two nodes, and one molecular orbital with three nodes. So I'm not actually going to construct the molecular orbital diagram because, dad bling it, your book has such a great picture of them all, but let's just look at them more closely. So here's the lowest level molecular orbital, pi, um, pi 1, where the only node is the nodal plane between the molecular orbital on the top and the molecular orbital on the bottom, bottom fully delocalized, illustrating the equivalency of the carbon-carbon bond lengths and strengths. Yes, that explains how wonderfully stable and um, planar benzene is. Then what? Well, this molecular orbital, pi 2, is easy to see. Three bonding interactions here, three bonding interactions here, one nodal plane. That's very understandable. It's pi 3 here that's a little bit weird again. In order to retain the symmetry and just have one nodal plane, we just have to have two carbons here that have no p orbital. Nothing, not on yet. So that's, the these two are equal in energy, the two di degenerate pi 2 and pi 3 molecular orbitals of benzene. Pi 4 and pi 5 also degenerate, same sort of situation. We're going to have to lose out um, on the p orbitals on these center two carbons to retain our symmetry. But now instead of a bonding interaction here, we've got to throw in some anti-bonding phase changes. And finally, the worst one of all, pi 6, all of these interactions are anti-bonding, highest energy of all. So, HOMO and LUMO, well let's put in our electrons. We have six pi electrons in our pi system, so one, two, three, four, five, six, all in a very low energy preponderance of bonding interactions super stable pi system. So that is why the reactivity that we'll see for aromatics like benzene is governed by wanting to retain this super stability. If we have substitution, I will be able to still have this kind of molecular orbital diagram Whereas if I had an addition reaction, that superstability is lost. I have now dis disrupted the aromatic ring. I don't have the magic number. I don't have a conjugated system. I don't have that superstability. But if my bromine undergoes substitution instead of addition, you betcha, I got a really nice stable system. Six electrons, magic number, cyclic planar conjugated, all is right 
in benzene's world. So, those are the rules for aromaticity. Benzene's a super simple example. It's pretty obvious. But what's with this whole planarity thing? Why does that even matter? Well, here's a good example. This is 10 annuline. 10 annuline has a magic number, right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. That would work for n equals 2. This is another way of, of describing Huckel's rule. An odd number of electrons, an, an odd number of pairs of electrons. So, clearly, it has the magic number. It's cyclic, that's obvious. It's conjugated, there's a p orbital on each one of these carbons. But this is not an aromatic molecule. And the reason why it is not an aromatic molecule is because these two hydrogens cannot occupy the same space, which is what they're being asked to do if it were planar. No, instead, and I can't really draw this very well. Oh, I can't draw this at all. Who am I kidding? Nope. I'm not really sure what that looks like, but it's a bad depiction of 10 annuline. What I'm trying to show is that if this is the plane that is 10 annuline, it's skewed so that one of the hydrogens is below the plane and the other hydrogen is above the plane. And in so doing, it twists the p orbitals so that they are in turn askew. Oh boy, is this looking crazy or what? And so they can't overlap to allow for that delocalization as we saw in the previous slide so that all of the p orbitals can overlap. I'll have a nice illustration of this in class. Uh, but it won't be a better drawing, I have to admit. So, planarity has everything to do with it because the p orbitals must be able to overlap. And if they're twisted out of the plane orthogonal to one another, can't happen. So, what about other less obvious examples like, oh my gosh, ferrocene. Those of you who are in ITR have learned that this is an aromatic molecule. We've gone through that, but how would you know that's an aromatic cyclopentadienyl ring? What about furan? Is this aromatic? How many electrons does it have? What's the hybridization of this, this oxygen atom? And, well, this guy, this is very similar. I think this is a midazole. Imidazole is a common uh, heteroatom, heterocycle. There's tons of heterocycles in nucleic acids. Are they aromatic? Oh my gosh. Well, let me tell you. I will get to that in just a second. Actually, I'm not going to get to it in just a second. I'm going to get to it in class tomorrow. But because you have suffered through three mini lectures for chapter 14, two without jokes, I figured it's time to give you a joke. So the joke is, uh, a chemistry teacher was recruited as a radio operator in the First World War. He's busy at his job and becomes, with the familiar, becomes familiar with the military habit of abbreviating everything. Next thing you know, his unit has come under a sustained attack, and he is asked to urgently inform his HQ. So he gets on the radio and immediately and rapidly reports, NACL over NAOH, NACL over NAOH, he says. The officer at the other end says, NACL over NAOH? What on earth do you mean? And of course, the radio operator says, the base is under assault. Get it? The base is under assault. Hey, okay, well, we will see you in class. We will do these tricky heteroatom ions and other weird stuff in class. So 
Never fear, aromatricity is tricky, but we'll get you through it. Alrighty.